Again, I'd like to welcome all those who are joining in for this uh, Bible study this Wednesday evening. We're in the study of Romans. Currently, we are in the 10th chapter, verse 10. So that's where we'll start. But before we do, though, let's have a uh, short word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the guidance that is provided us from thy word. In this world of great confusion and controversy, we're thankful to have something as steady and proven as our holy word. And we pray, Father, that we may pro prove uh, diligent and faithful servants of thine in our study of thy word, in our application of it, in our lives, in our proclamation of it to others, and in our defense of it from all those who would oppose it. Pray then they will bless this study and keep us in our care. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 10 reads, uh, For with the heart one believes, and that's a present passive uh, uh, in the Greek, believes unto, and unto points to the end for which a thing is, is done. So with heart one believes unto righteousness, that's where it's headed. And with the mouth confession is made, that's also present passive, unto, again, points to the end for which a thing is done. And it points to salvation, unto salvation. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. <clears throat> now here you might uh, read verse 9 just quickly said uh, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus believe in your heart that God has raised raised him from the dead you will be saved so verse 10 uh, reverses that order so question is can one uh, believe in vain well yes in first Corinthians uh, 15th chapter verses 1 and 2 it reads there moreover brethren I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and in which you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you and if that's the, the word of faith which we preach in, in verse 8 uh, preceding you know, this verse which I preached to you, unless you uh, believed in vain. To believe in Christ with the whole heart, uh, and then in obedience to surrender to him the whole will, is uh, to perfect human duty. It leaves nothing to be done, and comes short of no end. It is all, and it accomplishes all. Here Paul connects the belief with righteousness and confession with salvation. He cannot uh, possibly intend to imply that belief without confession will secure righteousness or that confession without belief will secure salvation. Both go together and therefore it is likely just his way of uh, expressing these sentiments. In verse 11, <clears throat> for the scripture says, uh, quote unquote, whoever, and whoever includes everyone, Jew and Gentile, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So it's an assurance that what Paul has been saying will come to pass. Now one fulfilling the conditions will be saved. Uh, being uncondemned, uh, there is consequently no cause for shame. In Isaiah, the 28th chapter, verse 16, we read there, Therefore this says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever, whoever believes will not act hastily. In verse 12 of chapter 10, 
it reads, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And it cannot mean that no differences at all exist between Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, if you will. Uh, there were plenty of differences, religiously, ethnically, socially, et al. But under the gospel of the Christ, there are no differences. All are created alike. The same gospel calls all, no matter what the differences. The same obedience is required of all, no matter what the differences. The same mercies are offered to all, no matter the differences. The same grace is extended to all, no matter the differences. The only differences that now exist are temporal, created by the voluntary conduct of different groupings. Now, if the Greek obeys Christ and the Jew does not, the Greek is, is accepted and the Jew is not. Now, the reverse would be true as well. Discrimination among peoples is based solely on obedience to Christ. Christ is the same Lord to the Jew and the Greek. Also, he is alike rich toward Jews and Greeks. Now, that is, he's rich in mercy and in the, in the provision of salvation. However, every member of each group must call upon him individually. Of course, to call upon him is to recognize him as the divine the son of God and address and treat him as such. Therefore, the Lord will not be rich towards anyone that would hold from him his due honor. In verse 13, it says, for whoever, again, that's Jew and Greek or Gentile, if you will, uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> now, the person who calls on the name of the Lord is uh, not the one who merely says to him, Lord, Lord, and does no more. We know from Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 21 and 22, it says there, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? <clears throat> well, it could have been a reference to the person who has believed on Christ with a heart, obeyed him and having been saved now addresses him as lord but more likely you know, this matthew quotation refers to the one who has uh, performed every act of obedience following belief that is repentance confession and baptism uh, this is calling on the name of the lord such as we find in acts 22 verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. <clears throat> In verse 14, how then uh, shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Uh, Paul had just connected salvation with calling on the name of the Lord. The question naturally arises is how can one call on or appeal to someone in whom he does not believe? Well, it can't. If one cannot be saved without calling on the name of the Lord, then belief is essential. Yet many Jews and Gentiles had not called on the name of the Lord. Since a belief is essential, how can they believe in him of whom they have no knowledge? They can't. No more can man believe without hearing than he can call without believing. 
Now, belief does not come independently of hearing the gospel and reasoning with it. No other way can belief come to an individual. How can one uh, hear without a preacher? How can they hear without a preacher? Well, they can't. They really can provide themselves with preachers. God in his uh, providential workings will do that. But not all peoples will hear what is preached. The Jews did not, or did many of the Gentiles. Also, Satan is just as busy and will send false preachers to deceive the hearers. The hearer has the obligation to consider what is preached in the light of some objective standard, and that standard, of course, is the gospel. Not only that, uh, but man has a further obligation to search out God, that is, a preacher, someone that will preach the word to him. In Romans, the uh, first chapter, verse 20, uh, for since the creation of the world, his invis invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they were, are without excuses. Now that gives a person the incentive to search out the maker of these invisible, uh, uh, the uh, creation, search out those invisible attributes. But he's going to have to have revelation to know what the will of the Father is. In verse uh, 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and who bring the glad tidings of good things. In Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verse 7, we read there, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. And also in Nahum, the first chapter, verse 15, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly uh, cut off. So how can they uh, preach unless they are sent? They have the same answer. They cannot. It is obvious that the apostles were sent to preach the gospel. So how are preachers sent today? Who are qualified to preach, uh, whether they do or not? First, they, they must be a genuine, sincere Christian, pious in heart and pure in life. Second, they must know the truth of the gospel for, for the that, of course, is going to be their message. Third, they must possess the ability. Uh, that is not to say that those with uh, limited communication skills cannot still study with them believing they can. Uh, ability increases with practice. One who has all three qualifications must also feel it his duty to use these attributes to preach and teach God's word to the lost, and to keep the saved in a saved condition. Because the message was uh, preached was so precious and wonderful, uh, that is, glad tidings and good things, uh, so uh, precious and wonderful to those who heard and accepted it, it's said, it is said to be uh, beautiful. The feet are referenced since that is primarily how the apostles and, and disciples traveled in those days, unless they, like Paul, occasionally traveled by ship. In verse 16, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For I, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? The gospel has been preached. The apostles and others had preached the gospel to Jews all over, and the same was true of many of the Gentiles. 
But by and large, they did not obey. God had afforded them the opportunity to obtain mercy, but they refused. God desired their obedience and tried in every way consistent with his nature and principles to secure it. The phrase, quote, who has believed our report, unquote, refers to the gospel and those prophets that foretold the gospel. Also, it implies that most did not believe, although, uh, of course, we know that some believed. All, is, as used here, does not mean every person who heard the gospel did not obey. But not every person who heard the, heard the gospel, include, including Jew and Gentile, obeyed the gospel. Uh, in verse 12, immediately preceding this verse, it was stated that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. In verse 17, it's a, a verse we're very familiar with. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. <clears throat> faith, uh, that is belief, comes from or arises out of the report heard. The report heard is the cause, and faith is the effect. Thus, this is how faith is produced. The faith produced is the faith that leads to acceptable obedience, then to remission of sins, then to justification, and finally to glorification. <clears throat> the whole concatenation uh, that just means interconnected things, things that, that go together. The whole concatenation is this. The report heard originates in the mind of God and respects his son. It is, it is reported by the preachers of the gospel. The gospel is heard. Belief comes out of what is heard. Out of belief uh, comes obedience. Out of obedience comes remission of sins, salvation, justification. And out of these comes eternal life. Verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth. And their words to the ends of the world. In verse, uh, in the Psalms, the 19th Psalm, verse 4, it reads there, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. So have not uh, Jews and Gentiles, and, and especially the Jews, not heard? Yes, they have. The gospel was preached first in Jerusalem, next in all Judea, then in Samaria, and finally in the uttermost parts of the earth. All Jews had heard the gospel or had, heard, had an opportunity to hear it. At the time, so did many of the Gentiles. Uh, they could have believed had they been so inclined, but they either refused to hear or hearing refused to believe. Their sound uh, of voices had gone out to all the earth, and the words carried in their voices went to the ends of the world. In verse uh, 19, but I say, did Israel not know? I know it's kind of it's used in the way of did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And that's from Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, verse 21. <clears throat> What is it that Israel did not understand? Uh, they did not understand or would not accept if they did understand how God intended to deal with the Jews and Gentiles. 
if the Jews did not understand, they had no one else to blame. God had forewarned them by Moses and Isaiah, but these forewarnings were grossly misunderstood and perverted. They were provoked by a nation that the Jews did not consider a nation, that is, the Gentiles. The Jews looked on the Gentiles with contempt. God moved them to anger by the Gentiles. God did not, however, directly seek to provoke Israel into jealousy. He did intend to accept the Gentiles on condition of obedience to Christ, and he did intend to reject the Jews on condition of disobedience to Christ. And of course, he knew that this would excite the Jews to jealousy, so he could say that. In verse uh, 20, but I, Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was, it was, I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. That's from the 65th chapter of Isaiah, the first verse. <clears throat> Paul here refers to the Gentiles. Uh, they at one time had God in their knowledge, but willingly forgotten. Thus in time, forgetfulness becomes ignorance. The true conception of God had ceased from their thinking. They therefore did not seek God or did not seek knowledge of him. They did not offer the worship due him, nor did they seek either to please him or to seek his uh, mercy. If God was excluded from their lives, something will replace it. There's always something to replace it. But of course, this gave rise to the idolatry of the Gentiles. Yet when the true God and Christ were presented to the Gentiles in the gospel, their hungry spirits responded. They broke their idols, burned their books of sorcery, believed Christ, repented of their sinful ways, confessed Christ as the Son of God, were baptized into his, to his death, and rose to walk in newness of life. <clears throat> Isaiah had spoken of this as well as others, but Israel refused to see. They did, they did not see Christ as their long-awaited Messiah. They were blind to all that had been written, and never anticipated in their wildest imaginings that the Gentiles could possibly become the Lord's beloved in place of them. Inconceivable to them. <clears throat> in verse 21, says, but to Israel, he says, and ASV says, as to Israel, he says, all day long have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And that's from Isaiah, the 65th chapter, verse 2. So God is drawn to his people in an earnest effort to dissuade them from their rebellion and induce them to do right. In uh, contract with God, Israel is not only disobedient, uh, but even this actively opposing God, I should say in contrast with God. Thus, we have here the reason for Israel's downfall. In disobeying Christ, they disobeyed God. In speaking against the Son, they spoke against the Father. Now, rejecting Christ was the downfall of Israel, yet they were blind to the fact. They did not learn from their from the plain declarations of their prophets. Beginning of the 11th chapter of Romans, first verse, I say then, has God cast away his people? Well, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> 
Has God rejected all the Jews? And the answer, of course, is no. He has rejected only the unbelieving Jew. But the nation was unbelieving. Therefore, the nation was rejected. Individually, however, there were believing Jews, and these he accepted. For the nation to be rejected was inconceivable to the Jewish mind. Consequently, he refused to grow in the knowledge of the truth, that is, the Jew. As Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 4, God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Furthermore, Paul's prayer was that, quote unquote, all may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, understanding, close quotes, that's from Colossians, the first chapter, verse 9. They had the form of knowledge and truth in the law, Romans 2.20, but did not like to retain God in their knowledge, Romans 1.28. But as he said, they were always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy, the third chapter, verse seven. Paul said in uh, verse uh, you know, chapter ten, verse two, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. With a mindset as as this, the Jew refused to see the only thing that could open his eyes namely the light of the gospel <clears throat> let it be said again god's rejection of israel as a nation in no way interfered with the opportunity of the individual jew to obey the gospel and thereby secure his salvation even today most jews still re uh, reject christ but the door remains open if they refuse to enter in they alone are to blame. Paul's declaration that he is an Israelite proves that God has not rejected the Jew based on his nationality or ethnicity. One exception, Paul defeats that claim. And of course, there are many others. Later in verse 5, Paul will mention a, a remnant. Uh, so there are many others in addition to Paul. In verse 2, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Nor do you not know, or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, and he continues that in uh, verse uh, 13, but we'll get to that in just a moment. The question asked in verse uh, 1 of this chapter is again answered. God has not cast away his people. Uh, it is an indisputable that God has rejected the national Israel, but not the individual Jew. The nation was rejected because of unbelief in Christ. The individual is accepted because of belief in and obedience to Christ. Many denominationalists ask whether God has rejected the Jewish nation forever. At some future date, they aver, God will restore the nation of Israel, which was rejected previously because of unbelief. Some go so far to say that the present day nation of Israel is proof that God intended to restore Israel. The nation was rejected because of unbelief, and any restoration, if it is to take place at all, will be based on belief. The current nation of Israel has not accepted Christ as the Messiah. In fact, you know, for the most part, uh, the present day Israel is a secular nation, and many of the Jews there do not even accept the fact that there is a God. And this is the only condition that the nation would be restored as God's chosen people, if it were to happen at all. 
the establishment of a secular nation proves only that a secular nation can be established. The Greek word translated here as for new is the same as translated for new in verses uh, in chapter 8, verse 29. But it is used in a different sense here. The word there denoted an act of knowledge coextensive with the divine existence in relation to those who God foresaw from eternity would obey his son, but without divine compulsion to do so. He cannot be saying here that he did not cast away his people whom he foreknew, since he has foreknown everyone, even those who, out of the exercise of their free will, uh, would accept Christ or reject Christ. Most Jews rejected Jesus, but not all Jews. God foreknew that. Everything that is knowledge or constitute knowledge, God knows even before it uh, happens. Paul cites uh, passages from uh, 1 Kings uh, regarding the prophet Elijah in uh, chapter 19, verse 10 of 1 Kings. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take uh, my life. And First uh, uh, Kings 19, chapter verse 14, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. Uh, with a sword, and I alone am left and seek to take my life, similar to the other one. In First King uh, 19, and uh, verse 18, of course, uh, we know there that uh, God spoke to Elijah and said, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all, those, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And uh, we'll see these again in uh, verse 3 and verse 4. Uh, we're just going to get to shortly. Now, these passages refute the notion that God wholly rejects his people. Although it seemed to Elijah that God had rejected the whole of his people, except Elijah, of course, he had not. The message is that God has not now rejected all the Jews. Just the unbelieving Jew. In uh, uh, verse 3 of chapter 11, uh, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. And that, that of course, comes from the King, first Kings passage that we just read. And, of course, the altars torn down are the, are the lawful altars. <clears throat> In verse 4, but what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That again comes from the First Kings passage uh, uh, that we just read. So he's saying to Elijah, uh, you, Elijah, you're mistaken. There are 7,000 men you do not know about who have remained faithful to me. So even inspired men, inspired prophets, may be wrong uh, when expressing their feelings and not speaking for God. The same is true of those addressed by Paul. It says in verse 5, Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to, to the election of grace. In rejecting Israel as a nation, God did not reject those individuals who believed in Christ. They constituted the remnant. This was not just any remnant, but those who, uh, those selected, chosen, or picked out of the whole nation of Israel uh, by uh, belief that the remnant conformed to the choosing or picking out. The remnant consisted of those chosen and no others. But the choosing was peculiar. 
uh, it was a choice of favor, a choice proceeding from or arising out of favor. Although favor prompted the choosing, it was not the reason for the choosing. Now, the, the reason existed in those chosen and not in God who chose. It lay in their obedience to Christ. Obedience then was the reason for the choosing and retaining. Uh, election or choosing in the case of the redeemed does not preclude, precede obedience and therefore is neither the cause of obedience nor the reason for obedience. Obedience uh, precedes election and is the condition of election and is the reason for election. Obedience is man's own free act uh, to which he is never moved by prior election of God. Uh, choosing, on the other hand, is God's free act prompted by favor and conditioned on obedience. Of course, God seeks man's obedience solely on the basis of his love for man and never by previous choice, uh, which basis uh, is in harmony uh, with his uh, nature. In verse uh, 6, uh, it's going to be kind of a long uh, commentary on that one. So since we're almost at the end of uh, at the bottom of the hour, we'll stop here and begin this uh, verse 6 of chapter 11 next week. Thank you.